We've got the top 10 must-ads in fantasy basketball this week. Coming up next on Beat the Odds, don't go anywhere. Hello, sports fans, and welcome back to another season of fantasy basketball. I will be here giving you fantasy advice every step of the way. So if that's got you pumped, then smash that like button, subscribe to the channel, and ring that bell to be notified whenever we drop an episode. Now this is the first episode of Top 10 Ads this season. I will be releasing an episode each weekend this year. The players listed are owned in 50% of standard 12-team redraft leagues or less. This list is also based on 9-cat leagues. That includes turnovers. And as always, if you think there's a player deserving to be on this list, drop a comment and I'll feature him in the next episode. Now with that out of the way, let's dive right into number 10. Javon Carter, 28% owned. Last season, he posted 8 points per game with 2.5 rebounds and 2.4 assists, 1.8 threes, 0.8 steals, 0.4 blocks, 1 turnover on 42% shooting from the field and 82% from the line. Carter is battling it out for a prominent role on this Bulls squad and all signs are pointing to him clocking 26 to 30 minutes per night. He's been a steady defender throughout his career and it's likely that the extra playing time will push his steal rate to over one per game. He's also 27, per putting him firmly in his prime with the best opportunity that he's ever had. I'd expect great things from him this season. Let's go to number nine. We got Bogdan Bogdanovich, 42% owned. Last season, he posted 14 points per game with 3.1 rebounds and 2.8 assists, 2.7 threes, 0.8 steals, 0.3 blocks, 1.2 turnovers on 45% shooting from the field and 83% from the line. At this point in Bogdanovich's career, you should have a pretty good idea of what to expect. He's a low to mid teen scoring uh, type player at a healthy clip with a handful of threes and a good amount of production in the, in the other counting categories. He's not going to win you a scoring title just as much as he's not going to run himself off of rotation. You can pick him up if you need threes as that's going to be his most impactful category. Let's go to number eight. We got Derek Lively the second. He's owning 25% of leagues. Last season uh, in NCAA, he posted 5.2 points with 5.4 rebounds, 1.1 assists, 0.1 threes, 0.5 steals, 2.4 blocks, 0.7 turnovers on 66% shooting from the field and 60% from the line. So based on those NCAA stats, why am I high on him? It's those blocks. He's an elite shot blocker, which is typically a difficult stat to farm. He also has been named a starter, which will give him more floor time with both Luka and Kyrie. He rim runs really well, and he's got the ability to grab double-digit boards on a nightly basis, with the uh, aforementioned blocks there as well. I wouldn't expect, of course, too many points to be scored from Lively this year. Let's go to number seven. We have Denny Avdia, 45% owned over the season last year. He posted 9.2 points with 6.4 rebounds, 2.8 assists, 0 0.9 threes, 0.9 steals, 0.4 blocks, 1.6 turnovers on 44% shooting from the field and 74% from the line. Washington should be in the running for the worst team in the NBA this season. They are lacking for star talent and depth. This does give Avdia an opportunity to take on a larger role for his squad. He's not going to be counted on to score a ton, although I do see his points per game increasing this year. I really do picture Avdia as a glue guy for this team, pitching in whenever he's needed. Let's go to number six. We have Kobe White, 25% owned over the course of the season here last year. He posted 9.7 points with 2.9 rebounds, 2.8 assists, 1.7 threes, 0.7 steals, 0.1 blocks, one turnover on 44% shooting from the field and 87% from the line. Free throw shooting aside, Kobe White has not really lived up to the hype so far entering his fifth NBA season. He's certainly much more of a scorer than he is a playmaker which does happen to benefit the Bulls as they do have a healthy amount of playmakers in their lineup. White has been playing well this preseason and he may enter the year as the Bulls starting point guard. And if that happens to mean 30 minutes a night, then he is certainly worth the ad. Let's go to number five. We have Sadiq Bey owned in 36% of leagues. Over the course of the season last year, he posted 13.8 points per game with 4.7 rebounds, 1.5 assists, two threes, 0.9 steals, 0.2 blocks, 0.9 turnovers on 42% shooting from the field and 86% from the line. For now, Bay is the starting point uh, power forward. John Collins is in Utah, so there's going to be a good amount of minutes to soak up. Now, minutes, of course, is the key when looking on the waiver wire, and if Bay can hang on to at least 30 minutes per game, he's a for sure add. 
It would also help if they could post a field goal uh, percentage north of 45%, which might be a bit of a large ask as he has shot under 43% in each of his first three seasons so far. Let's go to number four. We have Paul Reed owned in 42% of leagues. Last season, he posted 4.2 points with 3.8 rebounds, 0.4 assists, 0.7 blocks, 0.7 steals, 0.7 turnovers on 59% shooting from the field and 75% from the line. Now, these stats were all accumulated in under 11 minutes per game. Let's soak that in for a second. If you were to triple his minutes at 33 minutes per game, his line would read as a double-double with 4.2 stocks per game. This is why Reed should be on your squad. He's going to be backing up uh, Joel Embiid this year, but he has been projected to play alongside him at, on occasion, which should increase his minutes that he's going to play. If he happens to get 20 minutes per game, watch out. He's going to certainly be somebody who's going to help out a fantasy squad. Let's go to number three. We have Taylor Horton Tucker, owned in 18% of leagues. Last season, he posted 10.7 points with 3.2 rebounds, 3.8 assists. 0.93s, 0.6 steals, 0.4 blocks, 1.9 turnovers on 42% shooting from the field and 75% from the line. THT is back and he's going to go in with a major role as a starter for a Jazz team lacking guard depth. He has the ability to score in bunches while being an effective distributor as well. He's also shown up in the preseason with some huge all-around lines and the hope is that he can back those lines up once the season happens to start. At number two, we have Jeremy Sohan, 36% owned over the season last year. He posted 11 points per game with 5.3 rebounds, 2.5 assists, 0 0.6 threes, 0 0.8 steals, 0 0.4 blocks, 1.7 turnovers with 45% shooting from the field and 70% from the line. You're now looking at the Spurs newly appointed starting point forward. By all accounts, Sohan has displaced Trey Jones in the starting lineup and it's going to be interesting to see how he's going to perform once the season kicks off. For now, however, picking up a player like Sohan, who's going to be on the court alongside Victor Wembanyama, sounds like a really smart move. And last but not least, at number one, we have Jonathan Kaminga, 48% owned. Last season, he posted 9.9 .9 points per game with 3.4 rebounds, 1.9 assists, 0 0.8 threes, 0 0.6 steals, 0.5 blocks, 1.4 turn turnovers on 53% shooting from the field and 65% from the line. And the award for the preseason MVP has to go to Jonathan Kaminga. He's averaging 24 points per game in the four preseason games prior to Friday night's tilt, where as I check the box score, he happens to be the leading scorer for Golden State at the half. He is slotted in as the first big off the bench. However, his performance this preseason has me thinking that he may just be that spark that will fill the scoring void left by Jordan Poole this, uh, this offseason. And that's going to do it here for this episode. I hope you guys enjoyed it here. If you did, please be sure to like the video. Of course, subscribe to the channel and leave a comment if you think there's anybody that I that deserves to be on this list that I may have left out. Well, that's going to do it here for now. I'm going to sign off, but I will catch you guys on the next episode.